he's well known to uh, to most of you as um, uh, the former chief executive of Butterfly Conservation. Um, Martin's um, been with Butterfly Conservation for quite a long time now, um, focusing these days on the, the European aspects, but also, also busy on the, the Dorset Nature Reserve at Orners Gorse, I see. Um, mm. I think we, it's fair to say Martin's long-standing friend of the branch. Um, you know, he and I have, have been had uh, a relationship for a long time, and he's been very helpful in the early days of getting some of our current projects, like the Small Brew Project and Big City Butterflies in London, off the ground. Um, I won't uh, go on a great length about all his qualifications because I know that um, you probably know them all already, but um, I'll just hand over to Martin and um, about the secret lives of butterflies. Okay, well, thank you, Malcolm, and um, uh, uh, nice to meet you all virtually. It's a shame we can't meet in person these days so much, but uh, hopefully those days will return soon and I can get to meet some of you. Um, yeah, well, th so this this talk is <clears throat> um, hopefully uh, some new information for you, butterfly lovers, because um, so um, I mean, this is partly a plug for my book. So there's my book that I wrote um, uh, uh, just um, about a year ago. And um, in the writing of it, I mean, I thought I knew a bit about butterflies um, when I came to write, at least bold enough to <laughs> sit and think about writing a book on butterflies. But uh, as I did research, I learned some things that I didn't know about butterflies and I put them in the book and I thought I'd share with you um, six what I think are like secrets of butterflies, which um, I knew bits about but didn't know the full story. And I think they're intriguing secrets that, um, that you delve underneath the, the world of butterflies and you find these things out and so I'm sharing those with you today um, in in this talk. Um, so the first secret which um, I didn't know was that butterflies actually flew flew with dinosaurs um, and this got me looking into the whole history of um, butterfly evolution and it's a thing that's actually changed radically in the last five or 10 years. I mean, our knowledge, our understanding of when butterflies and indeed moths evolved. So I'm going to kind of come through this um, story with you um, and take you back into deep time when these amazing creatures evolved. So, of course, mostly people, when they think of evolution and looking back in time, think of fossils. And rather amazingly, um, butterflies do get fossilized. And this remarkable fossil, well, I think it's absolutely extraordinary fossil from the Isle of Wight uh, in a piece of limestone there. And you can actually see the markings on the wings of this fossilized butterfly. They're extraordinarily rare. Um, this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but this is actually the lid that went on that butterfly. So these are, they're not two wings. The, this is the fossil and that's the upper surface of the fossil. Um, and you can see the body and you can see the markings. And this particular um, fossil, um, sorry, just to go back, uh, it's three centimeters across, so it's not, not massive. Um, it comes um, from 34 million years ago, so already we're back into deep time, the end of the Eocene, this is about the time the sort of first horses evolved. Um, and even from this remains, we can tell that it was a relative of the Duke of Burgundy, uh, a reodinid probably, um, from the wing shape. And it's even been given a name, which is uh, this one and a rather unoriginal name, Ancient Stone Butterfly. So there we are, we could all have named that, I think. Um, so um, this re remarkable fossil takes us back into many, many years ago when at least this fossil um, evolved. But the story gets um, much more interesting, I think, from um, other studies that were done. So as recently as 2018, some uh, German researchers were looking into the, they were looking for pollen grains in the mud in the bottom of a lake. So you probably realize that lake sediments accumulate over time. And if you dig down into the mud, 
you go back in time and they dug down into the mud and as they were looking through these samples they came across these which they quickly realized were actually the scales of a lepidopteran uh, and they they reckon it's the one of the oldest fossils of a moth and this pushes the moths back to 200 million years ago so you know way back before that fossil butterfly of a mere whippersnapper at 30 million years ago these are 200 million years ago so this is the end of the triassic period so this is when the dinosaurs were first starting to come about on earth and there were the first moths at least the first evidence of moths and they even know that it probably was related to the family glossata so this is one modern example um, from this of a shape of these um, uh, fossil scale so this is already a remarkable thing pushing back our knowledge of the beginnings of the lepidoptera uh, way beyond the, what we previously thought you know by about 100 million years but then some even cleverer people, or I think so, this did this remarkable study. Uh, you can see the reference down here, the bottom right. I, uh, all these studies, I put the references on the bottom right, if you're interested. So this guy, Akito Kawahara, um, is interested in the evolution of the Lepidoptera, and he published this thing just in 2019. So I was, uh, as I was actually writing this book, I was rewriting this chapter as, it, as studies came out. Um, and uh, he, he basically what you can do with this mitochondrial DNA, you can actually look back at uh, how species are related and there's a formula you can use about the rate of change of DNA and you can get, use it to backtrack the um, evolutionary history of um, any group that you, you have enough DNA to look back at. And this rather complicated diagram, I'll just explain a little bit because I think it's absolutely fascinating. So here he's put together the evolution of the Lepidoptera with the evolution of flowering plants. I mean, the two went hand in hand for much of evolutionary history. As you know, obviously butterflies and moths feed on, um, caterpillars feed on plants. The more plants there are, the more opportunities there are for butterflies and moths to evolve. So the two went hand in hand. Um, and at the center of this um, diagram is 350 million years ago. And then you go a long time to get to the modern day here, where you have all these different species occurring from a common root. And so this is the evolution of um, the flowering plants, which just ignore for a moment. This is a, a, a diagram from his paper. Just concentrate on the right hand side for the moment. And so he, you go back here uh, 350 million years ago um, before the dinosaurs. Uh, and he reckons that according to this DNA evidence that the first um, moths came about about 300 million years ago. So there we are, the first moths. And that's already, so you remember the first um, uh, the, the fossil scales were 200 million years ago, so we've already, just in the space of this one paper, pushed back the evolution of moths a whole hundred million years to the beginning of the Permian. Um, and then you can see that the, the um, Lepidoptera, they, they, we call them now the scale-winged um, insects, uh, evolved and spread out into this very diverse group. It's one of the most diverse insect groups. Um, and the butterflies are just a small subset of these Lepidoptera. And they came about, uh, according to this um, diagram that he's and this backtracking, uh, they came about about 100 million years ago. So the butterflies evolved about 100 million years ago um, as a subset of this huge order of uh, Lepidoptera. So 100 million years ago, so that fossil um, from the Isle of Wight was 30 million years ago, and the butterflies evolved about 100 million years ago, uh, about there, in the middle of the Cretaceous. So the dinosaurs came about, as we know, in about the Triassic period, and um, they died out uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, that period of mass extinction, 
uh, the butterflies were there overlapping for about 30 or 40 million years, for an awful long period of time, uh, and uh, overlapped and no doubt flew around with dinosaurs in that early, early period. So uh, that's our knowledge of, of butterflies from this genetic backtracking. So they've been around for quite a long time, but nowhere near as long as the whole of the moths, which are indeed very ancient order indeed. So, so my next secret, I'm going back into the modern world and looking at uh, the, the evolution, if you like, of color and um, why butterflies have evolved these beautiful patterns. And, the, the secret, I think, and it was to me, because I hadn't kind of twigged this quite in such an obvious way, but there, there is no such thing as a glamorous butterfly, not in the sense that glamorous is appealing to the opposite sex. Um, so obviously we think butterflies are very beautiful. And of course, the e early evolutionary scientists, such as Charles Darwin, um, they thought that butterflies were beautiful like this because they were there to attract females and they thought that was why butterflies were colorful but of course if you start thinking about it looking into the biology of butterflies you realize that actually it's not quite the same thing and they were very heavily influenced by birds of course so we all know now that birds met the males are often brightly colored like this peacock and these bright colors are there to attract females and so the females are in birds are often much uh, less well colored, often drab, well concealed coloring usually. And the females are attracted to the males and they go, wow, look, look at that fabulous plumage on that male. I think that's the one I'm going to mate with. So I think the early evolutionary um, uh, biologists were influenced very much by bird um, mating behavior. But of course, when you look into butterflies, you realize that actually it's not quite the same as birds, because in fact, mostly the broad color patterns of butterflies, the males and females are rather similar. So here's our lovely silver wash artillery. Males are orange, the females are orange. They're slightly different patterns, but they're broadly similar. So it's unlikely that um, color is going to be the male main thing that is attracting the females. But of course, we have um, some of them, like the blues, where the males are often very brightly coloured and the females are rather drab. So that's rather like the bird situation where you have a rather drab um, female, but a brightly coloured male. But in the case of butterflies, it's the males that seek out the females, or usually it is. Um, and so the male is looking for a rather drab female. Um, and not the other way around. So it's very unlike, the, and she thinks, well, I'll wait for him to come and find me. That's her tactic. She rarely goes and looks for him. Um, so why are these butterflies, these beautiful blue butterflies, um, so brightly colored? Well, actually there's almost no research on it. And it's one of the things that I find quite astonishing when you look into the literature, you think some of these very, very obvious things will be well studied but they're not. And in the case of butterflies, the whole, the whole role of color in attraction is not well studied. It's a difficult thing to study, of course, with, with, with um, butterflies, but um, people have done them. And the studies they've done are, uh, show that actually the males, uh, sorry, uh, the, 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 let me go on just for one second, so I'll come back to that. So for, for butterflies, just to ca carry on that, what, how the butter it works in butterflies is that the males adopt two different tactics to find females. They have patrollers like the uh, white admiral on the left there um, and things like the tortoiseshell, the peacock and so on. The patrol, they cruise around the countryside looking for the females. And the other tactic is uh, the perches, like the Duke of Burgundy there, green hair streak, you know, a number of these other butterflies like purple hair streak and so on. They sit in a favorite location and wait for a female to come by and they chase intruders and hopefully to find a female that comes into their space. So they're the two tactics. 
So what is the role of the colour then? Well, it seems to be that the, I say, the only research that's really been done has been on the common blue. And it looks that the common blue is blue because that deters other males. So it's a way of keeping males out of the way of the blue butterfly and its patch. Although they're not exactly territorial, they often have a little favoured area which they cruise up and down. And it's a way of warning other males that this is my patch and keep off it. It's not really an attraction to females. So what is it uh, that how do butterflies do it? How do they get together? Well, um, initially the males do find colour. They look for male um, silver wash artillery here, which is this beautiful diagram that uh, Richard Lewing drew, Richard Lewington drew. Um, and it's um, basically what happens is that the male silver wash artillery chases anything orange. And so it looks for other similar looking um, um, butterflies to itself effectively and then it chases them and it, it's then as it, as it gets close it's all about smell then so um, butterflies both males and females release scents uh, which they can uh, detect for the other species can uh, the other sex rather can detect so in the case of the male silver wash artillery uh, it, you know it has these black stripes on its wing and these are called um, andraconia. And what happens is that when the male flies and it does this loop-de-loop -loop pattern around the female, it's showering the female with scent, which are released. And this is a close-up of the long black stripe, the sex brand on the, on the silver wash artillery wing. And it's releasing scent. So it's showering the female with scent as it's flying along. And obviously that's a way the female then can say, yeah, this male is actually silver wash artillery so it's the same species as me and um, if it is impressed by the smell and the courtship of the male then it will land and they'll mate pretty quickly so in butterflies it's usually about smell as they get close to each other and certainly in the case of whites of course the males and female whites they're all white so they they don't really they're looking, for, the males are looking for other whites, but when they get close, it's all about smell. And some butterflies, you, you, we can, human noses can actually smell. So our nose is reasonably sensitive actually to different smells. And uh, we can smell um, the smell of green veined whites, which if you catch a fresh one, actually smell of lemons. And other butterflies have smells which are much fainter, but this one really do smell strongly of lemons and there's quite a lot of research done on the role of these lemon scents in the attraction of female butterflies and to the male when they get close but the, almost like every rule in nature there are exceptions and the, the exceptions seem to be in the um, white family actually particularly these butterflies like the um, brimstone and the clouded yellows of course we only have one species really a regular migrant in, in the UK but if you go to Europe there's or oh, at least a dozen species of, of clouded yellows which all look rather similar but actually if you look at them under ultraviolet light they all have these reflective patterns so the um, brimstone has very brightly reflective patterns on the forewing which we can't see because we can't see into ultraviolet but butterflies can and they use it as a way of detecting flowers of different um, colors patterns with the ultraviolet and they and it's thought that the females actually are attracted to this uh, ultraviolet patterning of these uh, particular butterflies so uh, i mean in conclusion then the the butterflies, I said, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a glamorous butterfly, which is a sweeping statement. And actually, um, there's very little research done on it, but it looks to be that mostly the blue colours are to deter, the bright colours are to deter other males. Uh, but we think that some butterflies are glamorous um, in the ultraviolet, but uh, we just humans can't see that, but obviously the female butterflies can. So that's um, an interesting story, I think, in how butterflies uh, uh, um, see patterns and colour. Now, keeping on the, on the whole mating um, behaviour of butterflies, um, the, the other thing that I, I found from this research is that butterflies are really devious lovers. And 
uh, how they get together and how the cold courtship and mating works is actually quite complicated and it's been unraveled by researchers across Europe and the world actually. So here's um, uh, a courtship ritual that some of you may have been lucky enough to have seen. It's uh, wood whites and here's the male which has got the dark wingtips uh, and what happens is that when a male finds a female it sits opposite and it starts waving its antennae and its proboscis, it actually extends its proboscis and waves it in front of the female, backwards and forwards like a metronome. And the female just sits there, passive, not really doing much, occasionally flicking her wings. And it's thought that the flicking of the wings is just wafting pheromones um, backwards and forwards so that the female can assess whether this butterfly is indeed a male wood white and again on the continent there are three or four species of wood white which look very very similar and no doubt this scent plays an important role um, in the detection of members of the right species so that's a sort of uh, a pre prelude to mating and if the female is receptive she will curve her abdomens and they'll mate pretty quickly and what happens then when they mate, obviously they join together and they couple together and the sperm is transferred to the female. So um, in the case of butterflies, what's transferred is not just the sperm, but actually a thing called a spermatophore. And this is a package of sperm plus nutrients, and it can be up to 15% of the body weight of the male. So it's quite a big chunk of substance that is being passed across. And it's sperm and it's and in the nutrients, there are amino acids, salts and sugars. And these are all things that the female will need in order to lay lots of eggs. So he's giving her what's called a nuptial gift in which she uses then to make lots of eggs. And obviously that's in his interest as well, because they're his eggs as well. They're part half his genes in there. And she can lay more eggs if he passes over more amino acids, which she needs to make more eggs and sugars for her to fly and so on. So uh, that's what goes on at the mating time. But um, so in, in, in butterflies, um, mostly they mate only once, but some of them mate several times. So the green veined white uh, can mate up to six times and you can see from her point of view, at each mating, not only does she acquire some sperm from the male, but she acquires nutrients. So actually, the more she mates, the more nutrients she has and the more eggs she can make. So for her, mating more times is actually a way of increasing production. But for the male, of course, um, it loses 15% of its body weight, so it has to feed up for quite a long time, several days, to get more nutrients. And of course, in that time, if the female mates again, then of course there's less of his sperm going to be in her eggs. So he doesn't really want her to mate again um, because a lot of her eggs won't be his own. So um, the, the, the difference is there is that the male really only wants her to mate once, but the female doesn't. But as I said, in many butterflies, they mate only once. And that's partly because their lives are so short, it's really not worth them investing too much time in mating again if they've got enough nutrients. So the, the green gland fertility is, a, is one that's been researched. And again, not a lot of butterflies have been researched in detail, at least not British ones. Um, so the gland fertility has been researched quite in some detail. And... Um, it can mate several times, um, but usually it's once. And at the first mating, it, it lasts usually about an hour and a quarter. Uh, but the, they, they found out that the spermatophore, this package of nutrients, is passed in the 30 minute, the first 30 minutes. So why do they remain coupled for the rest of the time? Well, they think it's because the male is actually... Um, he, he's he's hanging on to her. He leaves an anti-aphrodisiac pheromone so that she doesn't mate again and males don't want to mate her because she's not producing the right pheromones. Um, but if they mate again, the matings last, the, the, if the male mates again, 
that the mating will last about three and a half hours. And the thinking is, is that that means she has less chance to time to mate again, and she'll want to spend what time she has left on this world laying eggs rather than mating again. And it seems to be that the, the older the male, the longer the mating, and that's a sort of so that he maximizes the, the chances of the, it, their, his um, sperm that's actually in the eggs that are being laid. So these um, slightly contrasting requirements, if you like, of the males and females comes about. And there's one last trick that one or two butterflies use. And so the marsh artillery, when it's finished mating, um, actually leaves a waxy plug. So the female physically cannot mate again. And some European species um, actually produce quite a big um, structure called a sphragus, which actually stops the mating again. So it's like a, a, a chastity belt. So the female cannot physically mate again after she's been mated in the case of marsh artillery. But I think it's probably, there's only one other butterfly, the green grayling, which probably does this in the UK. So um, what's the conclusions of these, uh, the secrets that are going on into the butterflies mating games? Well, basically it's that males and females don't always want the same thing. Obviously they want to get together, mate and make babies and make eggs, but um, they have different tactics because they want to maximize production and they play games with each other to make sure that it's mostly their genes or a bigger proportion of their genes that are being passed on. So that's a fascinating, and I'm sure there's been more research will be done to elucidate some more complicated things that are going on. But as, as I understand it, that's the story as far as we know it. Um, now, my fourth secret is actually the secret of survival. And this is a phenomenal story. And of course, anyone that thinks about it will realize that uh, actually butterflies and their caterpillars are actually just food for other things. Um, so here you've got a picture, yes, uh, adult butterflies get predated by birds, um, but also as their caterpillars and egg stages, they are often get predated by beetles, for example, or they get parasitized by these um, parasitic uh, wasps, like this one here. And um, you, if you think about it, that, so a butterfly, um, if you uh, assumed a butterfly lays 100 eggs and half of those eggs are females, half males, they all mate, how many would you get 10 years later? Well, it's a phenomenal number, actually. It's that number. Uh, so um, un, if there weren't predators out there and parasites eating the caterpillars, uh, we would be completely overrun with butterflies might be nice for a while, but they'd eat all their food plants and probably die off. So actually nature finds its balance there that all these eggs that are being produced um, are actually food for something else. And that's partly why nature is so complicated and so wonderful. We we're talking at the beginning about fluctuations in numbers. Well, it's one of the reasons why um, these fluctuations occur. So if you look at the wood white, so this is a species I studied, um, and you can actually look at for every hundred eggs that are laid, what happens to them. So basically, as they eggs develop into first, second, third, fourth in star caterpillars, pupil stage, and then to adults, you realize that actually there's mortality at every stage through the life cycle. So something is eating them all the way through. So from eggs, so actually of those 100 eggs, actually only 56 of them will hatch into caterpillars on average. So already there's a massive mortality going on just in the egg stage. And then, as I said, they get eaten and eaten and eaten. And on average, out of every 100 eggs, about five adults emerge. So on a very rough calculation, uh, if a female lays 50 eggs, she will replace herself in number roughly one male and one female would hatch as a result and keep the population going on a level course. But of course, if she lays slightly more eggs than that, then she might be more successful and numbers will build up. But if numbers drop like that uh, below 50, then the population will decrease. And uh, all the research that's been done on this, and there's some very clever research, which is described in my book, um, 
the mostly for young stages, so the eggs and the caterpillars, young caterpillars, it's mostly other invertebrates that are eating them. So spiders, beetles and so on are eating the caterpillars when they're young. But when they're bigger, they get more attractive to bigger prey. So birds are the biggest predators of bigger caterpillars. And as you might imagine, the bigger caterpillars are more well defended against uh, other insects. Um, and they have a lot of them have these arrays of spines and so on, which deter predators. So, uh, but the biggest of all killers are not predators, but parasites. So some of you probably have reared butterflies uh, from the caterpillars that you've caught in the wild and actually realized that actually they, they actually develop into parasitic flies and not into beautiful butterflies. So I'm going to just have a little diversion into the world of parasites because it is an extraordinary world and is again not well researched but there's been some fabulous recent studies of parasites and how they work. So here's um, a, a, a parasitic wasp called Cortesia glomerata and it's a wasp that stings almost exclusively into large white caterpillars. So these are large white caterpillars. You can see they've just hatched from the egg. And this wasp um, is uh, in, injecting her eggs into the caterpillars. And the wasp eggs will develop inside the caterpillar and eventually cause the caterpillar to die and the wasp will emerge. And they can kill over 60% of caterpillars in the large white case. And amazingly, there are egg parasites. And this extraordinarily amazing picture, I think, from uh, Nina Fatoris, who's a researcher in the Netherlands, uh, shows a parasite actually sitting on the side of um, a large white egg. And that's the name of the parasite, Trichogamma effinescens. It's tiny, 0.3 millimeters long. And believe it or not, it in, injects its eggs into the um, egg, and you can get about eight adult um, flies come out of that one egg. Um, and what, how they find the egg is quite extraordinary. In this paper, she describes what happens. And what seems to happen is that the parasite hitches a ride on the adult large white and there is the uh, this extraordinary picture of the parasite sitting on the um, head of this large white and they only attach themselves to females and they only attach themselves to females that have been mated so they already know these amazingly clever flies which ones are going to be laying eggs and what they do of course is when the female starts laying a batch of eggs they nip down off the butterfly and they've got their prey items already lined up down there for them so it's an extraordinary life cycle um, hitching a ride on the adults now many of you will know that the uh, other butterflies get incredible levels of parasitism and particularly the marsh artillery. So the marsh artillery, because it lays its eggs in batches and has caterpillars that live all together in this web, it's particularly prone to parasitism. Uh, and um, there's a, 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 a parasite called Cortesia bignellii, which occurs only in the marsh artillery, so it doesn't occur in any other uh, butterfly at all, specialised just on the marsh artillery. And its numbers build up as the caterpillars develop and the parasite itself has three generations for every caterpillar generation so uh, its numbers build up through the year as the caterpillars develop and eventually can cause up to 87 percent mortality and it's one of the reasons why marsh artillerys go through this real boom and bust life cycle because of this um, parasite but to me, perhaps the biggest secret of all of this story is, as this saying goes, big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. And that's nature in its great, rich, 
diverse tapestry. So here's a picture, um, another re fabulous researcher who's looked into this. And here you think, oh, well, here's a parasite parasitizing a caterpillar. In this case, it's a gland tillery. But actually, no, it's actually something even more remarkable than that. It's a wasp called Mesochorus stigmaticus, and it's actually a hyperparasite. So it's actually stinging a parasite which has already infected that caterpillar. So if you think about the amazing evolution going on here is that this parasite has skipped, if you like, the caterpillar idea of parasitizing it, but it's parasitizing the parasite. Um, and you think of how it's detected whether there is already a parasite within this caterpillar and the mind boggles, but it must be some chemical uh, smell that it's picking up on that it knows that that caterpillar has already been parasitized. And if it hadn't been parasitized, it would ignore it. So it's an extraordinary story. And if you rear um, caterpillars and find parasites you'll, uh, and get them identified, you'll actually find that a proportion of them are actually these hyperparasites and not actually the primary parasite. So it's an extraordinary um, food chain, if you like, building up within the caterpillars themselves. So. One thing that when I did the research for the book, I, I, I tried to find out, well, how many parasites are there in butterflies? And it's actually a very, very difficult question to answer. But I have actually listed in there how many the, the butterflies, the parasites that have been described so far. And it's about 70 parasite species that have been identified from butterflies in the UK. So about as many as there are butterflies. Um, four of them are specific to just one butterfly, so they don't infect anything else at all. So this beautiful insect, well, I think it's beautiful, is a, is a wasp called Trogus lapidator, and it only um, parasitizes the swallowtail. And the marsh tillery I mentioned, and the others are green hair streak and holly blue, which have specific parasites. But the egg parasites, uh, the research is really only just beginning. Um, there, there is an unknown number of egg parasites and they're very difficult to identify. So that's a question that is yet to be answered. And there are a lot of hyperparasites, but again, there are very few people studying them and very few, uh, hard to get information on how many hyperparasites there are in butterflies, but there are a lot. Right, so moving on to my fifth uh, penultimate secret is um, the secret of caterpillar defenses. So as you might imagine, with all that um, parasitism and predation going on, there is an enormous evolutionary pressure for caterpillars to defend themselves. And uh, again, not so much has been done on this, but um, some work has been done, and I'll just attempt to explain some of the secrets of caterpillar defences. So here's a picture of a caterpillar on an elm leaf, and I hope you can all see it. Marvellous caterpillar. You can see where it's been eating, but can you see it? There it is. It's hit, hiding away in plain sight there, and it's got this most incredible camouflage. And indeed, most caterpillars, as we probably realise, have got good camouflage. They're quite difficult to find in the wild. I mean, they're small, obviously, but uh, they're very well concealed. And that's their primary form of defence is camouflage. So here we are as two examples, one of a brimstone there basking on the buckthorn leaf. Um, and it raises its body up from the leaf, but we think to avoid a shadow, which it might be detected by birds, which is primary predator. And here's a high brown artillery, which I think mimics bracken fronds very cleverly um, to deter or to avoid predation. And some do extraordinary things. So two of them, two species in the UK, use um, uh, bird dropping, um, camouflage. So these, the comma and the swallowtail have these splashes of white, which look superficially like a bird dropping. And obviously birds don't want to eat bird dropping. So uh, that's how they do it. Uh, other methods of defence are 
are quite simple really well one is just come out at night and then birds and so on aren't around but there are other things of course lurking around in the undergrowth at night but um, not birds so things like the meadow brown and duke of burgundy are primarily nocturnal some butterflies have evolved to live in cases so they adopt a different tactic they're, they're green still so they're still well camouflaged but skippers often live in tubes which they spin together and they live in and they have little forays out to eat and then things like the grizzle skipper is positively armor plated there in a whole load of leaves spun together some of the gregarious caterpillars, like I mentioned, the marsh artillery, have uh, spin webs, and these webs do do something to deter parasites, particularly. And here's a marsh artillery inside there. There'll be about two or three hundred caterpillars um, protected by that silken web. And of course, many of them have these spines and tubercles, like the um, nymphalids, the brunessids, the silver wash artillery there with spines, peacock with spines. And if they get attacked by either a bird or a, um, indeed a parasite, they lash around with these spines and that deters some of the predation and parasitism that they might otherwise get. And then others actually produce foul smell. So this one is probably quite famous to butterfly watchers is the swallowtail caterpillar which has this extraordinary structure called an osmaterium on the end of its head, which it, it extrudes um, if it's attacked by birds or indeed insects. And I think the, work, the jury is out a bit on what it deters most. It's, it's eaten still by quite a lot of birds, but it's probably very effective at deterring ant predation, for example. And some of them are extraordinary. And this um, amazing picture by Peter Eels, some lots of pictures from Pete, by Peter Eels here from his lovely book on butterflies, um, butterfly life cycles. And here, this is white admiral, which actually eats away the honeysuckle leaf, lives down on this little tendril that it doesn't eat through, and it barricades itself with um, its own droppings, its frass, um, does a barricade against other insects. So they get up to some extraordinary things to um, deter predators. Um, and a number of them have become toxic. Uh, they've developed toxins within their body so that they're actually poisonous to um, predators. And so the large white has got very um, toxic uh, chemicals within its body, uh, which are actually heart poisons. And if a bird eats them, it will be sick. Uh, and once this work that's been done very recently on some of the fritillaries, which is quite new, I think, um, and particularly the glanville fritillary, which uh, those of you that know this butterfly, it feeds on young plantain growth. And these plant young plantains have higher levels of toxins in the leaves and the caterpillars store the toxins. And they advertise that fact with these, sorry, with these um, red heads which they thrash around if they're attacked by predators. So these red heads are a warning signal. But as with many butterflies, they adopt a whole range of defensive tactics. So these obviously have the defensive spines as well as having the red heads. Now, um, many caterpillars are possibly toxic, but we don't really know much about it. And um, Miriam Rothschild, when she was alive, um, had this theory that marbled whites were toxic. And it's difficult to work out because they feed on grasses. So there's no toxins, there's not much toxin by way of toxins in grasses. Um, but she thought, well, a black and white butterfly, which is so conspicuous, has got to be toxic, surely. You know, that was her theory. And it was only after her death that somebody actually did some research on this and found that, um, sorry, let's go uh, back, uh, that, that actually these butterflies, um, the caterpillars are toxic and they actually get their toxins from the fungus called ergot, which infects grasses. Um, and ergot is the um, chemical that actually infected bread in the Middle Ages. So people were eating particularly rye bread and got infected with this ergot fungus, which is actually very toxic to humans as well. 
and um, sent people mad, actually. This thing called St. Anthony's Fire, which is a sort of sign of madness, but it was actually caused by this toxin that people were eating in their bread. And this same toxin marbled white store in their bodies to make them toxic. And this study um, actually showed that um, several other butterflies have this same ergot toxin in them. So meadow browns, orange tips, and even silver wash artilleries get this, um, to some toxicity from this ergot fungus. But it's only really just beginning to be researched. It's devilishly complicated to study these chemicals and even more devilishly complicated to work out whether it actually influences survival. And many of you know that kind of the ultimate deterrent, I guess, for in the in the butterfly world is to have ants protect them, protect you for yourself. Um, and so many of the lysinids, the blues and some of the hair streaks uh, uh, attract ants and the ants protect them from predators and parasites. And here's some amazing pictures taken by Peter Eales again of ants. Uh, and they are attracted by secretions that the caterpillars produce from two, two organs, really. There's a, uh, here, here's a close up. Oh, sorry. Uh, here's a close up of the rear end of a silver studded blue caterpillar. And they have what's called a honey gland, which produces honey. So this, this ant here is actually eating the secretion off the honey gland. Um, and they have these tentacle organs. And if, if you ever get a chance to see a silver study blue, particularly caterpillar, it is quite extraordinary because they have these tentacle organs which pop in and out like little bottle brushes, uh, particularly when ants are uh, around. And it's an amazing phenomenon. And these tentacle organs are thought to release sort of pheromones which are attractive to ants and keep the ants in attendance. So that's the ultimate deterrent, and that's very successful for um, the, these blue butterflies. And as you know, the story, I'm sure, of the large blue, which actually goes one step further and actually lives down in ants' nests. And here's a, um, a, a caterpillar being milked by a, a red ant, and they take the ants down, as you know, into uh, the ants' nest, where they live the whole of their life cycle, or most of the rest of their life cycle, being protected by ants and actually eating ant grubs. So they turn from being a herbivore to being a carnivore and a, pred a predator of the ants themselves. And they're protected, obviously, down in the ants' nest. Um, so just moving lastly on to my um, ultimate secret, I think, of butterflies. And I had to kind of, it's a complicated story, this, so bear with me. But um, the, the secret is that butterflies are genetically modified organisms. And this, again, has only recently been discovered. And it's a bit of very incredible genetic detective work that's done it. Um, and the work was done only as recently as 2017. Um, and it's, it was done actually not on a UK species, but on a, um, a butterfly that's found in America called the black swallowtail. And it has this amazing parasite, this beautiful wasp here, which parasitizes this black swallowtail. And <clears throat> what happens is that um, when, when the parasite um, injects its eggs into the caterpillar, um, it injects as well some viruses called brachoviruses. Here, this is the word brachoviruses. And these are quite large viruses. So we all know we're all experts in viruses these days. So viruses are really basically packets of genetic material that just replicate within the host. Anyway, so these brachoviruses are injected within the, with the eggs and they develop also within the caterpillar. And it seems that the viruses actually serve to block the butterfly's immune system. So butterflies have immune systems like we do. So again, we're, we all know about immune systems these days. And butterflies have immune systems that would sometimes defend themselves against the viruses and indeed against the parasite. But the viruses block that immune system and they help the parasite to survive. So in this case, early on in this story, the viruses are actually helpful to the parasite. But occasionally, 
the parasite dies for all sorts of reasons and the caterpillar survives. And in those cases, they found that the actual, some of the genetic material of the virus is inserted into the butterfly genome. So into the DNA of the butterfly itself. And this is a process known as horizontal gene transfer. And basically what happens is that, as you know, the, when genes, uh, when the, a cell replicates, um, the DNA splits in the double helix and replicates itself. And when it's doing that replication, the virus plugs itself in to the genome. And that's a way, of course, if you're or if your own per, only purpose in life is to duplicate yourself, which is the case of the viruses, then that's a great way because every time then that cell divides, your DNA divides as well. So the viruses um, get into the DNA of the caterpillars and they um, then insert it into the genes of the, of the butterflies. But what in a final twist in this story, and it may go on, is that if the caterpillar, if the butterfly survives with this inserted virus gene, it's better able then to protect itself from subsequent invention, infections by the virus. So actually having this inserted um, gene, this virus gene into the caterpillar, into the butterfly um, genome, actually helps it from protection against future infection by the parasite. So it's an extraordinary story. Um, it's very complicated, um, but I think it's just an extraordinary um, way that the, shows you the complicated uh, way evolution um, develops to, so that there's this sort of war between predator and parasite and the host, and it goes on and on and on and uh, it gets more and more complicated. Um, and a final twist of this, I only read this just the other day, is that actually um, we ourselves, the human race, is also uh, genetically modified in the same sense, in as much as at least 8% of our own genome is actually comes from viruses over through this process of horizontal gene transfer. So it's a, it's a thing that goes on a lot in nature, uh, and we don't know much about it, but... Um, it probably plays a role in all sorts of different things. Anyway, so there we are. Butterflies are genetically modified organisms, but then so are we. So that's my final secret. And I think when, what this does to me, I mean, I've been interested in butterflies and I'm obviously we're interested in conserving them, um, but I think it just adds another layer of intrigue into the secret lives of butterflies. So I think just when, when you next look at a beautiful butterfly and you're taking this photograph, you're thinking what a stunner this one is, um, how all the things it's had to do to get there, sort of it going back from its evolution in deep time, uh, all the threats that it faces to develop, the mating rituals it's had to go through and the evolution that's gone through to uh, attract another mate. And how it's had to survive all those different predators and parasites to um, eventually emerge as this beautiful butterfly and have the um, skill, if you like, to succeed in laying eggs and providing the next generation. So there's a lot going on under the skin and the scales of these beautiful butterflies. So that's the end of my talk. Um, a big thank you to sparing your evening to listen. And a thank you particularly to all the photographers. I tried to credit them all as I went along. And particularly the researchers. I mean, the research that's taken to um, unravel these complicated stories. I mean, it is quite extraordinary, painstaking research. Um, but I hope adds to your, um, your hobby of studying and looking at butterflies and helping conserve them. And, actually understanding what amazing creatures they are. Thanks very much. Martin, thank you ever so much. That was an absolutely fascinating um, insight into some of the aspects of butterflies life. Yeah, my, um, mind bending, isn't it all? <laughs> absolutely incredible, <laughs> believe it. Yeah. Um, but, um, 
I think you, you, we have got um, a bit of time for questions. Um, if, if anybody's got a question, um, maybe um, we'll take perhaps take perhaps take the uh, well, one or two went in the chat box. I think so. Perhaps we'll take those first. But if um, after that you could unmute and um, yeah, happily ask unmute, questions. just ask questions. But yeah. um, we could just start the ball rolling by somebody and and there. Well, I think Brian had asked, um, is it true that uh, but butterflies are the reasons that dinosaurs <laughs> died out, no, having no, eaten no. all their plants? I read that someplace. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be a conspiracy theory. I don't no, know. No, that's, I mean... that's one of the theories. But my big question is this. Um, <clears throat> my big question is this. I, lucky me, I've had a chance to see uh, I was standing in a field once with 50,000 Essex skippers, which we call European skippers here yeah, yeah. in the United States. At once, there, there was a big flurry of them 20 years ago, and they've, they've really, the population's gone down. But I've been in fields with 50,000 small whites also. And never in my life have I seen a bird eaten, eating, eat uh, an adult butterfly. And so I am of the opinion that almost all butterflies sequester some, some kind of poisons in their body. Otherwise, you know, you can walk in the field and, and walk right up to a uh, small white and can't put it in your hands and the bird is much faster than you. Now, why on a sunny day aren't all the swallows coming down and eating these butterflies? They're not. Yeah, I, I, think, they, you're, I think you're probably right, although um, I mean, the one thing I didn't touch on, which is that the actual flight patterns of butterflies, you know, they have a very jerky flight. And so that's one of the reasons why they're quite difficult to catch. But um, I agree with you. Why, do, why don't birds attack them? In the book, I mentioned this one case where I had a, 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 swallow, a, a blue tit, which ate loads of um, small tortoiseshells off my buddleia, but it's the only time I've ever seen it. And of course, if you think about your buddleia, it's covered in butterflies, they're sitting targets for a blue tit. Right. And why don't they just hoover them all up? Uh, it, so right. you're like you, I think they, there must be something going on that stops these birds from eating them. Well, I, I loved your talk, but obviously this is, this is good <laughs> stuff for volume two of your book. Yeah, well, I, I wish I knew the answers, actually, because uh, this whole thing about toxins, because actually um, a lot of caterpillars that are toxic, it doesn't pass on to the adult. Uh, you know, there's been some studies done on this. So actually toxins in adults has been very well, little study, but very few of them have been found to have a lot of toxins in them. Obviously in the moth world, it's very obvious. You've got things like the burnet moths. And of course right. they, they are really poisonous. I mean, if you had one, a, if you had a burnet moth, it would give you a really bad time. Um, and if birds eat them, but but obviously, you know, like this blue tit, that all the tortoise shells, it didn't, you know, it carried on. It obviously didn't kill the blue tit. So why don't they all do it? Well, just one more thing. Nobody thought they were poisonous birds and then, Several years ago, somebody licked the bird, and a researcher <laughs> licked the bird called a pitahui in New yeah. Guinea, and his throat swelled up, and he almost died. <laughs> and then they realized there are poisonous birds. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know who's who's doing this research on, yeah. on uh, imagos. Who who's doing the research on adult butterflies that they're that they're not poisonous because, you know. Well, I think they're only what they're doing is they track the the glycosides that are in the caterpillars, and they find that actually the the, the, the levels in in the adults are much lower than in the caterpillars. Oh, okay. But not not universally. I mean, not not in the large white, definitely not. The large white is is the adults are poisonous. That's been proven. Um, but the small white, for example, isn't, and it's thought that maybe the large white, the small white is protected because birds know white butterflies are toxic, ah. therefore don't eat me because, and they're sort of cryptic, they're sort of the um, uh, mimics of, of okay. the large Okay, thank white. you. Okay, and um, we've got a question in from Chris as well, and she says, why don't more female butterflies of more species mate multiple times to gain yeah, spermatophore nutrients? I, it, it's a good, very good question. And um, my only guess, and it is a guess, uh, is that, you know, they don't live very long and they want to invest more of that time in egg laying rather than mating more times. 
So I, I guess that's it, but it's again, it's quite complicated to know why they don't make, they don't all make more times. Mm. I don't know the answer to it, other than the fact maybe they just get enough nutrients in that first mating that they can lay enough eggs that's that's enough for them. Yeah, thanks very much. And Claire, Claire Dory has said, I've actually seen a bird eat a very early peacock in flight. Oh, yeah. Um, and Liz, Liz Goodgy has said that birds love eating moths, especially first thing in the morning. Yeah, of course they do, don't they? Yeah, of course they can eat, eat the whole content of your trap if you're not careful. Oh, yes, yeah, so I've got some very well-trained robins. And if one flies off, the, the robin will catch it. Yeah. So, of course... So the, the moths can't be too... To moths can't be toxic. No. Otherwise they and, wouldn't, and, well, some of them can't be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be yeah, but if, quite happy to have them for their breakfast exactly but if you think about the whole thing about moths is that they fly at night to avoid birds so uh, they probably don't have to be toxic. no that's yeah, true so. but then the bats get them in yeah, the yeah, don't yeah. they yeah yeah, so, um, yeah can on. i ask about the changes in dna yeah. um because of those uh, parasitic wasps has have they done more research because if they're passing that change on to offspring then in theory, you could create um, a butterfly that's immune to that uh, wasp, could you not? Well, I guess that might have happened in evolutionary time. That's uh. true, in which case the wasp would pretty quickly die out. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, may have happened. I mean, this sort of arms race that's going on in evolutionary you know, time is, you know, the pressures are huge. You know, if you've got like marsh artillery, 87% mortality. Well, if you can avoid that somehow, you're going to do very, very well. Mm. Um, so there must be a race going on. And I guess in, in you know, the millions of years that it's evolved in, there will have been casualties on the way, both in terms of butterflies that have I succumbed to, <laughs> to, a, to a parasite that's too, too lethal. But as we know, as we say, we know with viruses now that, you know, the evolution of viruses is that if they're too lethal, they don't survive very well. Yeah. So actually what they want to do is just kill a, or just replicate. They, that's all they're interested in. So they're never really interested in killing the host. Mm. But uh, in parasites is different, obviously, but uh, I, yeah. I don't know of any examples, but um, I guess it, it might have happened. Thank you. Has anyone else got a question that they'd like to ask? Feel, feel free to unmute yourself and... Um and ask if you have. So, I mean, I'm interested if, if anyone does see um, uh, bird predation of butterflies. I'm interested in this because, I mean, it, it's, I mean, most, most um, lepidopterists have seen a bird eat a butterfly once in their kind of career, if you like, or twice, but it is rare as, as you suggested. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm interested to know when it happens and why it happens. And I mean, things like flycatchers, um, uh, when they were commoner in, in the UK, they were obviously quite well more common predators of, of, uh, of butterflies, but um, they're, de they're such a rare bird now. I've twice mm. seen, them, yeah. I, hello, I've twice oh, yeah, seen, I've seen falcons, a peregrine falcon in the Merlin catch monarchs, and taste them and drop them in flight. Yeah, so so that well, monarchs of course are the you know famous poisonous right. butterfly, um, very toxic. Yeah, you're right. The the birds, I mean, must quickly learn because it's not going to be good for them if they start eating them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the learning must be very quick, and of course it must be, and but of course you you kind of think that it might be hardwired in some of these birds. So so this whole thing about the white butterflies. And the fact that they're, you know, it's well known that birds don't eat white butterflies and they're all protected because some white butterflies are poisonous. But in evolutionary time, it must be, must have evolved to the hard wired so that young birds know that, that you know, it's not worth the risk of attacking white butterflies. But um, it would be interesting to know whether, you know, whether if, if all white butterflies suddenly became palatable, whether they would switch back again. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I had a report recently of um, um, a bird eating, hibernating small tortoiseshells and peacocks. So it was it, ones that were already sort of still 
which I guess makes them easier targets. But yeah. the bird, bird yeah, it was has a, gone it was a wren, wasn't up a hole. it? I think it was a wren got into the um, uh, hibernating area. I saw oh, that right. on Twitter. Yeah. There was wings everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good. That's a very good quite a Good point, actually. That yeah, hibernating butterflies do get eaten by birds. That's and true. commas. I've seen the wings of a comma yeah. in the winter, where something's got it whilst it's been hibernating yeah. in a tree. And that whole thing about you know the well the the eye spots obviously on the peacock, which are there to deter predators. But I think they deter mice. I mean, mice eat them as well. So and I think the eyes. Um, protect you know d deter both birds and um, mammals as well mm. i had a question martin i wanted to ask you which was wasn't was came out of your book but wasn't something you'd covered today right um and that was about the mobility of butterfly species because we within our branch area we've um we've probably had half a dozen species in the last 10 or 20 years that have spread substantially things like um uh, brown hair streak, um, purple emperor, small blue, um, yeah, brown yeah. argus. You know yeah. the, these are all these all seem to be the most highly mobile species that we've got at present. But in in the book, you you printed a table from Roger Dennis about mobility of species, and yeah. I was intrigued that all all the ones that are, are seem to be spreading in our area are all well towards the bottom of the yeah. mobile table. And I was really scratching my head about that and thinking. What's what's what, well, why are the mobile species not, not spreading more than the immobile ones? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, uh, it's so I think there's several things going on here. I mean, of course, um, one thing is that evolution is happening before our eyes at the moment, particularly with climate change. And I'm not sure if you're aware that the um, some people from the University of York, I think Jane Hill and her team up there have done research on, I think, the speckled wood. And they found that where it's spreading in northern Britain, the speckled wood this is, uh, the individuals are larger, they're slightly bigger, and they're slightly more mobile than the ones down south. And, and it, what happens, I think, with climate change is that, obviously, if you think you're in the northern edge of a range of a species, if you're an adult that's slightly bigger and you can fly north into empty space if you like there's no other butterflies there your eggs are going to develop really well and that those genes will be passed on very well indeed and so that slightly bigger butterfly gene if you like will will replicate at the northern range margin quicker than it does in the southern range margin and i think that's what they're finding and that also what it means is that once you've got like a bigger form of a butterfly which is more capable of moving which I think may be happening with these other species as well, then that, if you like, migration, if you like, northwards, that this gradual ex range expansion carries on regardless, because you've got, the, you know, that we know the climate has changed right across Britain. And so the, the spreading keeps going on once you've evolved this sort of slightly larger individuals. So, so mobility varies from individual to individual and population to population so that snapshot of roger dennis which is as you <laughs> it's compiled from all sorts of rather circumstantial evidence but it's the best that's been done because it's devilishly difficult to study butterfly mobility um and but i think there is evolution happening and from what i remember as well is it can work in reverse as well that lovely study that jack dempster did when the swallowtail became fragmented its habitats became fragmented and it, it lived on smaller and smaller patches of fenland as the fens got destroyed. And he looked back at all the museum specimens and found that they got smaller and smaller. And in that case, that evolutionary pressure was happening in reverse. It meant that the, the ones that did fly further died, and it meant that the ones that stayed were increasingly a little bit smaller than the ones that, that, didn't, <laughs> that flew away, um, and they became smaller and smaller. And so this, both two, these two factors could be going on and can affect mobility even in the space of 100 years. So it all, all can change quite quickly. Great. Is there anyone else would like to ask a question before we, um, before we go? Um, Roger. I think you might be on mute.
I'll put it in chat. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm helping here. <laughs> <laughs> Go and mute everyone. Well, I might, yes. That's... He might actually have his actual computer on silent. Um, well, do you want to put it in the chat? Can you do? Have you worked out how to do that? Just hit the chat button, type it they in. They lip read. Yeah, it's <laughs> um. You're oh, showing well. us not muted here, Roger. No. I don't think it's my fault. No, I think you've done <laughs> something. Oh, well. It usually is. Well, see, types. I should re remember. I go back to some many years. We. It was very late in the Purple Emperor season, which coincided with the flycatchers coming through. And this oh. family of flycatchers had found this assembly area. And this very, very poor old gentleman emperor was flying <laughs> around the assembly area. And eventually I said, oh, look, there's a leaf. <laughs> and no, it wasn't. It was the emperor. Going oh. backwards. That was the end of it. The flycatchers got it. I think Andrew uh, Middleton recollects uh, one of the Suffolk sites. The swifts or swallows were flying around the assembly area at the end of the day, and I think they were having a good chase. So I can't I can't remember if one actually was got, but they the swifts were certainly interested. Yeah, yeah, they yeah I have had records of swifts and swallows. So um, Rogers Rogers put something in chat. He says yeah. predation of adult butterflies when mating. Some species are secretive, others in the open. Do we know why? Yeah, well, I'm. I, yeah, you're right. I mean, when butterflies are mating, obviously they're very, um, or, you know, they can't really fly off so easily. So they are susceptible to predation then. So, yeah, why do, do some, one are some very secretive and others in the open? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I'm guessing it's just sort of some. Uh, they they're just as we've said that birds are not really going for butterflies by and large so they probably just don't need to hide very much but i know i know when when i've watched i watched uh, during lockdown i watched a lot of brimstones mating which i'd never watched before and of course it happens very quickly but once they've mated they just drop down and sit underneath a leaf and of course they're virtually invisible then um but then that's clearly uh, an evolutionary behavior to to disappear underneath on the under always on the underside of a leaf low down in the vegetation um so they they obviously hide but um why other species don't bother they sit out in the open you're right and and of course if you think about butterflies that are roosting in the evening they're just sitting around if you think of blues sitting around roosting in a communal roost you know any bird that fancied <laughs> Going munching a few blues would just mm. have a, f a feast, wouldn't it? So it's a puzzle. It's a real puzzle. This whole thing about bird predation. So, if anyone have any thoughts on it, I'd love to know. Mm. Now we got another question here. Do we know why some species have expanded, common in the last sixty years, and others have grown and contracted? Well, um, <laughs> yeah. So th this comes back to I think what's habitat availability usually, um, and Things like the comma, which have quite um, the, their requirements are found right throughout the UK and they were climate limited in the past. They were able to spread with climate change, um, whereas things like the grayling, which are um, quite specialist things, um, at least they require very specific microclimates, which are quite rare in the modern landscape. So they've declined because of sort of habitat management usually factors like that but it's quite complicated for each species i think and also mobility of course as well so we've just talked about some species spreading now the things like the brown hair streak for example which has been mentioned i mean it's a it's a butterfly that feeds on young blackthorns well they're everywhere you know right through this country they're up in scotland but the butterfly doesn't have found there because it's at the moment it's too cold but of course as climate change clicks in um that is you know, it's what's called its climate space uh, can move and the butterflies are obviously now beginning to move. And it's interesting, I think there's this sort of lag and it may be an evolutionary lag till they get to be some more mobile individuals that then take advantage of the extra warmth that there is further north. So, so mm. epigenetics, somebody's mentioned there. Yes, Sue Taylor, <laughs> yeah. Um, could epigenetics play a part in the rapid increase 
Could you tell us what it is first, Martin? Yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, so it's um, basically we all have genes and some genes are only turned on if the environment is right, as I understand epigenetics. And this is sort of so people assume that you, you, you want, you're genetically hardwired, but that's not the case is that. Um, so, for example, some people think, for example, that pollution um, is affecting how some genes in human beings are expressed. And I think, so it could play a role. Um, yes, it could, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. I don't know that anyone's done any research on this. But yeah, epigenetics is a new area which has kind of made people think differently about how evolution works because the environment can actually play a role during the lifetime of the adult. So um yeah so it could could be something going on there yeah it's all very complicated when you start looking at it <laughs> um there was another question about the roosting of blues how oh, do yeah. they avoid ground-based predators such as mice yeah good question <laughs> wow how do they do it yeah i don't know i mean i mean mice are going on smell usually so maybe they don't and of course blues are as you know they often if you're a photographer they often roost on very bendy <laughs> little bits of grass and it may be that those grasses are just not not you know mice can't climb up them and they mm -hmm. can't smell the blue on the end of the grass so they just don't know it's there i don't I, it's a good question yeah i mean spiders are their downfall the roosting butterflies i found um uh, grizzled skippers uh, predated yeah. by spiders. Yeah, I think spiders probably take quite a lot of adult butterflies, actually. Yeah, yeah I mean, roosting small blues that I've photographed a lot are very seldom close to the ground. They usually, yeah. usually find places that are yeah. you know, at least a foot off the ground, often more. Yeah. yeah. So yes, I guess that uh, keeps it's... them out of the way of ground-based mice. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, we've um, we've certainly had our money's worth from um, yeah. from Martin in terms of questions. But is, well, has anybody not... else got a question before they before my, we wrap my up? My brain's hurting at the thought of it all. <laughs> 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 of okay. Great. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, well, Juliet. Anyway, did you want to ask? Great to see you all, and um, good luck with your butterfly oh, season. I think I think we just have one more Martin from Ju okay. Juliet. Okay. Can you... um, I just wondered if there was much evidence of um, cross species mating. Well, yeah, there's some, if you, if you follow Twitter, there's some extraordinary examples of cross species mating, but I don't think they produce anything, anything viable. Um, they do happen with very closely related species, but I mean, the whole thing about species is that the progeny are not are usually not viable or not very viable. So, um, it's it, you know that's why mate that's why the courtship is so elaborate often is that the the, the females want to make sure they don't mate with the wrong species because their progeny won't survive then um, so I think it does happen uh, what's a, probably another question would be why does it happen you know why does a meadow brown mate with a ringlet or something like that you know what you, what, what does it get wrong but then I think the thing is if, you, if with now we've got so many people looking at these things that these very rare events get noticed and of course you know like human beings the butterflies are fallible you know they can have some genetic reason why they perhaps don't recognize the right pheromones in the female and they don't mate with the wrong species so all things can go wrong in this whole um sort of chemical um sort of signaling and i so i guess that's what happens and yeah but but it's uh yeah so i don't think we know why that happened but i don't think they ever produce anything that's uh, you know like a hybrid species mm. chris newman set put a comment in to say he's got a photograph of a small tortoise shell taking a an in interest in a peacock um which i i do i remember from last year which was a fantastic oh, okay. shot yeah i i watched a very very elaborate what I can only describe as a sort of courtship between the same two butterflies, um, a, a, a small tortoise shell and, and peacock, and I, I was fascinated by it. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know why it happens, why <laughs> they get it so wrong. 
and mm. others of course usually get it so right you know in, in most encounters like between a tortoise shell and a peacock they'll be off quickly won't they, in the opposite directions but um mm. something goes wrong somewhere yeah but it, it's often is yeah, if there are, if you do get to see two sp different species taking into, it often is ones that are very closely related species, like the, the meadow brown and the gatekeeper, or the tortoise shell and the yes, peacock. Usually, right? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't right. usually yeah. expect a monarch and a small blue. <laughs> 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 well, that's a challenge for the season. <laughs> our American friend there can probably be anyone that can do that. <laughs> yeah, great. So have, okay, um, there's another um, a comment coming from. Holland, I think. Um, I don't know if you can read it out, Mark. It's just come in. Oh, this is from Cars. Hi, Cars. Okay, thanks. Okay, in, the, in Dutch dunes, there were cameras at the nests of northern wheat ears, and of course, a lot of caterpillars, but also quite some adult fritillaries. So, so were the were the caterpillars eaten by these? Oh, cameras in the at the nests. Okay, so the nests. There were caterpillars being brought in and as well as adult Queen of Spain. So these particular wheat ears then were eating both caterpillars and mm -hmm. butterflies, which, so that's an interesting observation. So um, it does go on. And I know um, there was some research done on um, swallowtail caterpillars and they do get eaten by um, um, birds quite a lot. So despite all their defenses, they still get eaten. Great. OK, well, look, thank you so much, Martin. I think we'll, we'll draw it to Pleasure. a close there. Um, and thanks to everybody for, um, for sticking with us. Um, just before we go, I just want to remind you that the next talk we're having is on uh, Wednesday, the 26th um, of January, which is uh, Anna Gurin, who's talking about the 33 butterfly challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that was her challenge to see a different butterfly in every borough in, uh, in London during the last year, which she, she, she achieved um, and quite, quite a spectacular achievement it was. Um, so do, uh, do join us again for that session. And uh, in the meantime, safe journey and thanks very much. Yeah. Thank, Bye, you, Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>